Welcome to the Parent Guide to GCC podcast, episode number 15. Today's guest is Uju Asika, who is the author of Bringing Up Race, How to Raise a Kind Child in a Prejudiced World. Hello, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to our difficult but important conversations to have with your child. Uh, today, we are here with Uju, who has written a book called Bringing Up Race. So she seemed like the perfect person to talk to about all of this and about how to approach those difficult conversations about racism with your children. So welcome. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm hot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very toasty day if you're listening to this later on the podcast we're all kind of melting at the moment but um it'll be all right so um so yeah talk to us a little bit about uh, about the book when's it coming out what can we expect from it uh yes yeah, so bringing up race um is subtitled how to raise a kind child in a prejudiced world um it's out on september 3rd uh this year um it's available for pre-orders now um, on Amazon UK and Waterstones. Um, yeah, and it's it's a book, it's sort of a personal examination of, you know, how racism impacts all our kids, you know, um, whether they're black, brown, white, um, and also what we can do as parents to make sure that we raise children who are more empathetic and more open and inclusive. Um, so it's something that obviously is very personal to me as a mum. I interviewed a bunch of other parents, you know, mostly mothers um, of different ethnicities. And um, yeah, it's sort of aiming to start a conversation and keep a conversation going. And perfect timing for uh, release at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, unbelievable timing. I mean, it's uh, it's a strange thing because obviously when I was writing it, you know, I had a, a sort of little voice in the back of my mind thinking, you know, how much am I going to have to convince uh, people, especially the people that I want to reach with the book, how much am I going to have to convince them that racism is still a thing? Everything's you know, and, all, ah, there we go. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'll <laughs> Yes, um, no, that racism is still a thing and also that it affects, you know, everyone. Um, you know, so very often people think, oh, it's just racism is that thing that, you know, black people talk about or minorities talk about <laughs> and it doesn't really have much impact. But actually it's it's important for everyone to sort of get into this, um, this discussion and these understandings. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm coming from the point of view of until it's all been brought up very recently. I would have been one of those people who'd have said, but well, I'm not a racist, because I know that I'm not prejudiced. I don't treat people differently based on their skin color. I would never kind of say anything to deliberately harm someone. And I, up until then, up until I've seen all the stories, had assumed that that was, that was enough. You know, I'd done what I could do and that was, that was all I could do, because who am I to make any kind of difference? But all of the stories that are being told lately has made me realize that that is not enough that i need to be anti-racist not just not a racist and so mm-hmm. we've been trying to have the conversation with our kids and uh, you know with varying degrees of success mm-hmm. because i think i got a little bit overly emotional we uh, we showed our daughter the video of uh, black parents talking to their kids about what to do if you're stopped by the police and my mum instincts kicked in watching it and I'm sat there in floods of tears and I think she kind of she feels why and she understands but that's not the best way to have the conversation because it shouldn't be about my emotions about things so what's what's a good way to start that kind of conversation what's a good how would you begin the process of talking about this stuff with your kids any tips for us yeah i mean i think um you know in terms of having a conversation i think give yourself grace like you know allow yourself to be human allow yourself to have emotions around this issue it is charged it is really painful in many ways it is 
going to make you feel guilty and upset and worried and all these things. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to be honest with your children about how you feel, because I think children appreciate honesty, which is not to say that you want to just come and like flood them with, <laughs> you know, everything you're feeling and everything you're thinking. I think it's, you know, it's uh, just sort of take it at their own pace and take it at your pace. You know, one thing is just to ask, you know, ask a question, just start a question, you know, how do you feel about, um, you know, your skin color? Have you ever felt anything about, you know, most children these days, uh, well, it depends where you are, but many of them are raised around people of different ethnicities. So, you know, ask them like what their, what kind of conversations have they had with their friends about these issues, you know, sort of hear from them as well because it's it's always a conversation it's not a it's not a lecture so you know you can start with a question you can share your own experiences you can talk about the fact that you know maybe when you were growing up you were taught something different or you were taught to use different words or you know or you just never spoke about it at all and you know you want to do something different with your own children so um it's a good place to start and obviously now i mean i'm sure you've seen lots of sort of anti-racist reading lists and all this floating around the, the internet. And, you know, those are really helpful. You know, I have a chapter in my book um, called Books Will Save the World, um, which I really think books will save the world. And, and one of the things is, you know, picking up books that are about uh, people of different cultures, that center a, a black hero. And it's not always, you know, it's important to read books that are for education, but I think also just stories are really important. So, you know, start with stories and and let those lead your conversations. I'm also finding I'm, I'm much more aware at the moment of the shows that she's watching on TV and how diverse they are and whether they are in fact representative of all the different the cultures and ethnicities that we are surrounded by. I mean, we're in a, a fairly multicultural city in Peterborough and obviously in London and um, you've got kind of everyone and, and everything and it's it's not represented as well as that in a lot of shows that we watch and um, it kind of it's it's almost noticeable when there's a show that does represent people of color in uh, you know the digital authority and as the stars of the show and things like that Shonda Rhimes obviously mm -hmm. does it amazingly I think in yes. a lot of different ways and she brings up a lot of the issues as well because um stuff like um, Miranda Bailey in, uh, in Grey's Anatomy had to sit down and talk to her son, who is a, a young black man, about, I think he locked his key and was trying to get in through the window or look for the key under the, the mat and it could have gone very, very wrong. And they'd had a case mm -hmm. in the hospital the, the day before where it had gone very wrong for a, a lad in a similar situation. And seeing those kind of experiences is really helpful in terms of opening your eyes because if you don't experience something, it's really difficult to get your head around how it feels when you do experience it. And I think that's been the issue for um, a lot of parents that I've spoken to when they've said, you know, we're trying to have these conversations about race with our children, but we don't, we don't know, we don't understand because we've not been there. So are there any, is there anything that you found, particularly in terms of, kind of more kids TV programs that you've been impressed with in terms of their diversity that you thought, that's a, that's a good set of role models. I like that. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, one sec. <laughs> this is the George of Lies. Our kids do it for us as well. <laughs> um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think growing up, for instance, I grew up, you know, I was born in Nigeria and I grew up mostly in, in the UK. And, you know, if I saw a black person on TV, it was very much like a, <laughs> you know, whoa, good times, you know. And um, so representation is really, really important, um, not just as someone growing up as a minority, but also for um, as you said, for putting you inside someone else's skin, you know, stories are so important for that. Um, some of the shows we like to watch, I mean, we 
we watch a variety of shows, but we also actively seek out shows that are, um, you know, representative. For instance, uh, Blackish. I don't know if you know the show Blackish on Netflix. Um, that's like a, a show about a black family, and it's it's very entertaining. So that's one thing I recommend because you know you don't always want something that's really heavy-handed, and you know everyone sometimes a lot of the recommendations are like just really like heavy and difficult and sober. And you know for kids you want something lighter and you know fun and you can all engage with. So um, Blackish is really good. There was a show called Raising Dion on Netflix, which um, I referenced in my book as well because. Uh, as a, it's about a young black boy who discovers he's a superhero. And so it's really about his mother, you know, his mom is a single mom. And so she then finds out her son is a superhero and it's like, how does she deal with this? So it's, it's great because it's like, it's a story, it's a sci-fi movie. It's very inclusive. You know, one of his friends, you know, has a, a question she's in a wheelchair but there's nothing sort of patronizing about it in any way. And um, there's also a scene in which the mum talks to her son about an incident of race, racial bullying. And then she has to talk with him about, you know, the fact that he is not gonna appeal to everybody and how there are people in the world who are just not gonna like him because of the color of his skin. So it's quite a painful conversation, but it's really well handled because you see that she just tells it like it is and she doesn't try to like, soft soap it and she doesn't pretend she has all the answers you know and um she just lets him lets him know and yeah it's it's a good show so i recommend that um and there's a bunch like for younger kids there's a show called bino and fino which is um i think it's like possibly africa's first animated tv show for kids um so it was it's set in nigeria but it's it's been on i mean it's on you can find it on the internet but it's been on like um you know, terrestrial TV as well. And they're doing pretty well. And it's, it's very engaging and it talks about, you know, different cultures and stuff. We've been, no, sorry, sorry. interrupting. We've been doing the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air again recently. Oh uh, yeah. We really enjoyed yeah. And they do a great job of going between just super entertaining, mm -hmm. hilarious TV. And then these Seriously. sudden moments yeah. of seriousness where you do get an understanding. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that we've really, really enjoyed. Sorry, you were going to. I was going to say, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a huge topic in the news at the moment. And, and that's reflected mm. in my social media, particularly my Facebook feed. So many comments, mm. generally really positive people considering what's going on out there. Um, but also even with my own Facebook friends who I like to think are relatively like-minded, the amount of mm. nonsense I've seen posted is, mm. is just, well, staggering, frankly. It's a very good way to clear out your Facebook uh, friends. <laughs> yeah. um, concern is, though, with my, with the children, you know, two of them obviously on Facebook, what would they be yeah. seeing? How would you how yeah. would you deal with that? Because we don't obviously look at what they're doing. They're 18 now, and you know, we, we have to trust that they're acting responsibly and taking what they see, I don't know, with a pinch of salt or, 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 or kicking back yeah. against it. But that's my big concern is the social media element at the moment. So I guess it's kind of their their bubble, the people that you surround yourself with. You tend to think like them, and well, so it's important yeah. to have some more diverse opinions in your mm. social media feed, so that you you get a bit more of a feel for the world. Yeah. So things like so I guess my big question is how do I how do I teach my child, mm. our children, to be a better ally because it's all very well saying don't treat people differently because of their race but that isn't enough as we know so what sort of things should they be looking out for where can they be making a difference what can they do um i think there are just so many ways you know it always starts with your approach um and i think the approach is really sort of constantly wanting to learn and constantly being willing to change and um, not being defensive about stuff, which is a big thing because it's very difficult, you know, having conversations with people who are defensive, you know. Um, so it's always sort of being willing to, to accept, you know, there's a phrase white privilege that is bandied about and, you know, rubs a lot of people that up the wrong way. And now more people are starting to understand what it means. Mm. You know, I don't, 
bang on about white privilege in my book because I'm like, you know, sometimes you can get so hung up on an, on a phrase, you're you're missing the point. And the point is that, you know, if you have, um, you know, what's that saying? With great power comes great responsibility. If you have power in society, then you can use your power, you know, as a force for good, as a force for change. You know, you can be the voice who speaks up when other people are silenced. You can, you know, you can advocate for people. You can stand, you know, I think many of my white friends will have admitted privately that they've been in situations where, <laughs> sorry, my kids keep interrupting. Um, they've been in situations where, you know, someone has said something uh, racist in their presence or something that makes them feel uncomfortable and, and they're just not sure how to react or they go say, you know, this is your opportunity to, to speak up and to say, you know, that's not okay, that is racist, you know, call it out. Like, don't be afraid of ruining relationships over it because, you know, you've got to stand for something. Um, you can't just stay silent when you know that it's wrong. Um, so that's that would be my first point. Yeah. Oh, and that was coming back to the, uh, the social media. I uh, think I talked about somebody posted, I think it was an All Lives Matter uh, post. And yeah. I was sitting there shaking my head thinking, and it was a teacher who did it. It just didn't make any sense. And um, quickly looked down. There's already 20, 30 comments calling on it saying, mate, you can't do that. It's not on. And that, I think, was really empowering, I think, to see that people are just not happy. They're going to call it rather than just ignore yeah. it and move on to the next Facebook story. They made the time to say, no, that's not good. Yeah, because there's been so many posts explaining it in a really <laughs> clear and obvious way, I think. The whole, you know, quick, he's broken his leg, call an ambulance. Hang on, what about my leg? That's not, yeah. you know, you, that's not the point. You deal with the emergency, the critical <laughs> situation. It's not, oh, it's been explained so well in so many different, different ways, ways that I've seen that I don't think there's an excuse to not understand that. And I, <coughs> I find that frustrating because yeah. I am still seeing bits and yeah. and blocking people and and stuff I can't imagine how frustrating it must be to to be trying to fight for for rights for for black lives matter and have everyone go oh but hang on a minute <laughs> just <laughs> yeah so that is yeah. something we've discussed a, with kids. yeah there's a very funny um I'm trying to remember his name now. If you go on YouTube and you search, uh, I think Black Lives Matter comedy or All Lives Matter comedy. I don't know. There's a comedian who um, there's a clip of his on YouTube and it's really funny and he just handles it perfectly. I'm not going to attempt to, <laughs> you know, it's never funny when you try and tell a comedian's yeah. stand-up jokes, <laughs> but it's, it's really it's really worth watching and it's a good one to show your kids as well because. Yeah you know, if they're, they're old enough. I mean, I watched it with my, my kids, mine are 14 and 11. Um, and I, I don't think there's any swearing in it. But anyway, but it's, yeah, it's a good know, one to watch with your kids. Like, yeah, it's kids. hilarious and very well, very well handled. We'll try and find yeah. the link. Yeah, on the, on yeah we'll try and find the link and put it in the show notes, um, along with really. the, the link to the book and things as well. So <clears> are there any other kind of, what, what's your kind of big takeaway from the book that people... What, what's the kind of top tip that we can take away to help us have these conversations? Uh, what's the top tip? I think just, you know, staying, staying open, like I've said, you know, be open to um, different, not just different people, but different ideas. And this goes for everyone. Um, you know, I'm speaking to black people, to, you know, Asian people, the Muslim, you know, it's like people can get very entrenched in their own ideas as well. And you can also get very entrenched in your own um, struggle, you know, and there is more than struggle and there is more sort of communion you can have just by being open and being, um, being more empathetic and being willing to have conversations and to keep having conversations. I think one of my slight concerns with seeing all of these resources floating around everywhere is like it feels a little bit checklist. Like I feel like, you know, people are going to be like, oh, I've read this, I've 
watch that, you know, I've, <laughs> I've donated here and now I've solved racism. <laughs> you know, great, I am no longer a racist and I can move on. And actually this is just, it's like a lifelong journey, you know, for those of us who are in uh, darker skin or, you know, who look different from the mainstream, um, you know, this is, this is my life. Like I can't, you know, if I don't, Side. I mean that we talk about, um, you know, in the black, black people talk about like racial fatigue, like race fatigue, like it's exhausting. This whole thing of like constantly having to think about and talk about and deal with the microaggressions and all of this stuff. Um, but at the same time, it's it's also my life. Like I can't just be like a. Oh, I'm tired of racism now. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> I'm moving on. <laughs> you know, like I'm. <laughs> it's not really going to work out for me. So I think everybody has to acknowledge that this is a lifelong thing. And you know, if you're committed to being anti-racist, then you're committed for life, not just for this particular moment. Yeah. So let's talk microaggressions for a minute, because that's that's the sort of thing that people are doing who wouldn't maybe consider themselves racist because they're not trying to be deliberately insulting. They're just asking questions that they wouldn't have asked were you not a person of color. So talk to us about microaggressions and the kind of things that we need to avoid doing as people not of color because frankly it annoys you and isn't cool because <laughs> we need those tips. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long list it's a long long list um you know i do have a chapter in my book as well uh, which is on microaggressions it's called under the skin and it's about the stuff that happens sort of under the skin of polite society like you know especially people who absolutely would never imagine that they were doing anything offensive um you know they've done studies on on microaggressions and you know, it's really difficult because obviously the person who is a victim of it can feel something, but they can't always put their finger on it as well. And then the person who's doing it often has no idea that it's a microaggression. Um, so, but I think anything that's like intrusive or assumes that somebody is the other or places them as the other, you know, in any interaction, for instance, you know, as a, you know, I've obviously I was born overseas. So for me, if you ask me where I'm from, it is a slightly more layered conversation. But there are many people who look exactly like me who are being asked, where are you from <laughs> every single day? And like, I'm from Tottenham or I'm from, you know, I'm literally from like right next door to you. I was born next door to you. But, you know, as a white person, you might ask somebody where you're from based off of just looking at their skin color or the fact that they're wearing a term, but actually, you know, they're, they're British just like you. So, um, and I think one of the the main things for me was my, my kids' hair, you know, touching, people touching their hair. Um, you know, walking my kids, now their hair is a bit more uh, contained, <laughs> but they had like very sort of funky, big hair, let it go free. And, you know, walking the streets when they were little, people would just like reach out and grab their hair. And I'm thinking, is this normal? Like, <laughs> should you be doing this? And they're going, oh, I just love this hair. And it's it's meant to be a compliment, but actually, you know, he's not a dog, so <laughs> don't put your hand on my child, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, so yeah, I think it's just sort of checking yourself before, you know, if you're gonna ask something that you think to yourself, oh, would I ask this person this mm -hmm. if they were, if they look like me? Um, would I, you know, what are my assumptions that I'm making before I <laughs> launch into this conversation? Um, yeah, those things. And then if, you know, you're not going to get everything right, because we we all do, we all have unconscious biases. We all make sort of implicit judgments. So you're not going to get everything right. So if somebody does call your attention to it, then also honor what they've, mm. what they've said. Don't just instantly go, oh no, I didn't mean anything by it, which is what tends to happen. So, yeah. Yeah, kind of learn from it. I always find I um, I get 
a little bit self-conscious about asking people how to pronounce their name. I asked you before we went on the live stream, which is more, so as a teacher, I've taught kids from all over with all sorts of different names. And I got really good at Polish names because we had a and, and so they're names that I'm familiar with. But when we get kids from, kids from Ireland sometimes who have names that I'm just not used to pronouncing, <laughs> And I, I feel I feel uncomfortable asking because I feel like I'm picking on them because they have an unusual name. But I also don't want to just mm. mispronounce their name at them and assume that I'm right. So, I, I mean, I noticed on your on our emails that your full name is much longer. And I'm Emily. I'm quite often M. I use it as a shortcut because it's easier and I'm, I'm happy with that. But I know there are a lot of people. Yes. Um, we uh, we worked with Peter Ekwere Moefa, which took me ages to learn, but I can't do it without pulling the face. But um, he was Mr. E to all the kids because the kids wouldn't or couldn't cope with learning his full name. And that, that would bug me. Hmm. That would really annoy me. So things like, is that something that would that we need to be yeah. aware of in terms of, you know, would you would you have rather stuck with your full name or did you go Uju because it's it's easy for us white people to pronounce <laughs> and you got less grief for it. <laughs> well um <laughs> um well the thing the, the good thing is like Uju is like my is just a shortening of my name in Nigeria as well. It's a very common shortening so um you know, I didn't sort of change it to to Uju. I, I have a, you know, I write about this in my book as well. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I have a whole chapter which is about names and about how when I was growing up, you know, even just my name, there's three letters, you know, confounds people. And I used to just think, God, if I could just be called like Annabelle or, you know, Susan or something that just, you know, was, was normal. Um, but uh, actually, I think asking someone how to pronounce their name is the absolutely correct thing to do. You know, not every name is, is obvious, and mm -hmm. even names that you think you can pronounce sometimes are pronounced completely differently. You know, it could be like something Apple and they pronounce it Apple or something <laughs> in this day and age, who knows? Um, so I think that it's it's the the intention behind the way you call someone's name is what's important. You know, if you ask somebody and if you make that effort, and even if you don't get it right the first time, you keep making the effort to to get the get their name right. I think that's that's what matters as opposed to um just looking at a name and going oh, i'm not going to bother with that i'll just call you whatever which happens as yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah it really does I, um the, i've worked with teachers of various nationalities and they've all uh, where they've had more unusual particularly surnames because as a teacher that me? <laughs> i think we're getting and uh, and yeah, they tend to resort to initials just because it's easier than and than having all these kids who just can't be bothered. Um, yeah, frustrating. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we're probably getting towards the end. There is there anything else that we should know? Anything else that you haven't shared? Anything from the book that we haven't talked about yet that might be useful? Yeah, a shame. Um, I think just, um, you know, be, be brave, you know, be brave, have these conversations with your kids. Um, don't assume that they already have been taught about Martin Luther King at school, so therefore they're all clued up. Um, don't assume that it's too, they're too young. Don't assume they're too old to have these discussions. Um, so yeah, just just be brave in your conversations and keep having them. And awesome. We'll we'll figure all this out when we edit it for the podcast because I think we've got a bit of lag going on there. I know you started talking visually before we could hear you, and then we could still hear you, and you'd stop talking, and you were looking like, "Why aren't they saying anything?" <laughs> it's, we had a bit of lag, but like, we'll fix it. Um, 
thank you so so much you for your time much. it is very much appreciated and um we will make sure that we put links out for the book in uh, yeah we've got some there. <laughs> Um, and we'll yeah. find that clip as well if we can. Indeed, and we will, yeah, see if we can find the, the comedian. Oh, I see. <laughs> I <know. laughs> yeah. And uh, I think we'll probably give up there on the grounds that we're about 30 seconds off each other and <laughs> this is all going to go wrong otherwise. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much for your thank time. thank you. And um, we look forward to reading the book. Thank you.